Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm C. Shao, Tobacco Control Researcher at Ohio State University. Tops is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Justin White from University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University to introduce our speaker. Today, Ann Burton will lead a single paper presentation entitled, The Impact of Smoking Bans in Bars and Restaurants on Alcohol Consumption, Smoking, and Alcohol-Related Externalities. Ann Burton is a PhD candidate in economics at Cornell University. Her research agenda focuses on the social welfare implications of risky health behaviors and crime. Starting this fall, she will be an assistant professor of economics at the University of Texas at Dallas. Our discussant today is Justin White. Ann Burton will be presenting her research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Ann, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you everyone for attending my presentation today. I'm really excited to share uh, my job market paper with you all. Um, so I don't have any financial disclosures to report, um, but it, it is important to mention that um, one of the data sources I'm using in this paper is the Nielsen Consumer Panel. Um, and so while Nielsen um, at, through the Kilt Center at Chicago Booth has provided the data, um, they had no role in the analysis or in the conclusions of this project. Um, so ever since smoking bans in the US were implemented by state and local governments, um, they were you know, a relatively controversial policy, especially when they were first implemented. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about each of these possible effects of um, smoking bans, uh, starting with the effects on secondhand smoke. Um, it's well documented that um, in, you know, in the US and in other contexts, smoking bans, um, like in Germany, have reduced smoking, as well as cardiovascular and asthma-related hospital admissions. And then in Norway, smoking bans have been shown to reduce smoking by pregnant women, um, which has beneficial health effects for them, as well as um, improved like health and birth outcomes for their fetuses. Uh, bar owners, however, were concerned about the effects that a smoking ban in bars and restaurants would have on their business. Um, here I've put up some quotes from newspaper articles that ran around the time of implementation of these smoking bans. Um, and a common theme of them is that bartenders thought because so many of their customers were smokers, a smoking ban would lead these customers to stop drinking at bars and start drinking at home instead. And so as a result, um, they would see like a negative effect on their business. Of course, you might anticipate that um, non-smokers might go out to bars more often after smoking bans are implemented but bartenders and bar owners didn't think about that possible effect of the policy. Um, and then any policy that has an effect on alcohol consumption, either the amount or the location, could also have external effects on alcohol-related crimes. Um, previous research has shown that drinking at bars has been linked to increases in drunk driving, bar fights, homicides, and sexual assaults while drinking at home has been linked to increases in domestic violence. The question that I'm asking in this paper is, what are the effects of bar and restaurant smoking bans in the US on the amount of alcohol consumption, the location of alcohol consumption, so at a bar or restaurant versus at home, smoking, and alcohol-related externalities? 
I mean, just to give you a little preview of my results, I find that alcohol consumption increases and that these increases are most likely coming from bar and restaurant consumption as opposed to at home. I actually don't find any change in smoking status, so whether people report smoking or not. Um, I do, however, find a small increase in fatal drunk driving crashes in areas with a high prevalence of smoking, but I don't find changes in other alcohol-related externalities. Um, so, you know, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, uh, but governments have long intervened to correct market failures, um, such as externalities from cigarette smoking. Um, ever since the 1964 Surgeon General's report linking smoking cigarettes to adverse health outcomes, the federal government, as well as state and local governments, have implemented a variety of policies to try to minimize the prevalence of smoking and also mitigate the negative externalities from smoking. Um, some examples of these policies um, include cigarette taxes and minimum purchasing ages for tobacco, which were recently raised to 21 uh, across the whole country. And then, you know, another of these policies that I'm focusing on um, is smoking bans in bars and restaurants. And you can think of these smoking bans as representing a transfer of the property rights over the air in the bar from smokers to non-smokers. And what this does is it changes the environment of bars, which is what bar owners were so concerned about. Um, so you can think of it as representing a change in a non-price determinant of demand for alcohol in bars, um, or kind of a, a change in like how much people would enjoy drinking at bars. Um, and this, of course, could differ by smoking status. So if you think that smokers enjoy being able to smoke while they're drinking, a smoking ban in a bar could lead smokers to drink at bars less and perhaps start drinking at home more. Conversely, um, if non-smokers don't like being around cigarette smoke, then a smoking ban in a bar could make drinking in a bar more enjoyable for non-smokers, and so they might go out more. Another important feature of these laws um, is the spatial heterogeneity, um, which means that there are a lot of different ways in which people can respond to this policy. Um, and as an example of what I mean about spatial heterogeneity in laws, so in 2008, the state of Illinois passed a smoking ban in bars, um, but neighboring Indiana did not have a statewide smoking ban. Um, so the areas shaded in light blue uh, reflect places that have a smoking ban. So you can see that, you know, some cities and counties in Indiana have one, um, but not everywhere. So what that means is if someone lives in Chicago, they could easily drive half an hour to Gary, Indiana to go smoke and drink while at the bar. Um, but then of course they have to drive home somehow or get home somehow. Um, and so you can think that smoking bans might lead to competing externalities. So on the one hand, you have the externality from secondhand cigarette smoke, but on the other hand, you might have um, changes in alcohol related externalities. Um, so this paper contributes to a vast literature um, in, so I've just put up um, some papers in health economics, but of course I want to recognize that there are also a lot of papers in, um, you know, public health and tobacco control more broadly on the effects of policies um, targeting smoking. Um, and then with respect to the specific literature, on um, smoking bans and alcohol consumption. Um, I'm the first to incorporate city and county level laws. I'm gonna use broader and more representative data than prior work. I also contribute to a literature in public economics on the spillover effects of local policies and the optimal regulation of externalities. Then I contribute to the economics of crime literature on the relationship between alcohol consumption and a crime. Um, and the contribution I make here is that I'm able to identify a small increase in alcohol consumption that does not correspond to an increase in violent crime. Uh, so this map shows uh, places that had implemented a smoking ban in bars um, by the end of my sample period, um, which is 2004 to 2012. So the light blue places, um, such as California and New York, those represent places that had implemented a smoking ban prior to the start of my sample period, so prior to 2004. And then um, the blue-gray places represent um, places that implemented a smoking ban in the first half of my sample period. And the navy blue places uh, represent areas that implemented a smoking ban in the later half of my sample period. 
And then the areas um, in white represent places that didn't have a smoking ban as of 2012. Um, of course, there have been quite a few um, laws passed since 2012. Um, and so there are smoking bans in more places now. Um, but this is just uh, reflecting, you know, the landscape as of 2012. Um, and so the importance of including the city and county level bans can really be shown if you look at the South. So with the exception of North Carolina, the South doesn't have a statewide smoking ban in bars. And so if you only analyze the state level laws, you would be considering much of the South to be in the control group, when in reality, a large fraction of the population in the South is actually subject to a smoking ban in bars. So I'm using several different data sources for this project. Um, the American Nonsmokers Rights Foundation compiles effective dates of smoking bans in bars and restaurants. And then for smoking and drinking related outcomes, I'm using the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System and the Nielsen Consumer Panel. The BRFIS uh, contains measures of an individual's self-reported smoking status and alcohol consumption. Um, and the Nielsen Consumer Panel contains measures of a household's um, alcohol purchased for at-home consumption, as well as cigarette purchases. And so I just wanna say a few words about um, possible measurement error in alcohol consumption so that you can kind of think about that before I show you the results. Um, so you, you may or may not have picked up on the fact that I don't directly observe the location of alcohol consumption. So I'm using the purchases of off-premises alcohol in the Nielsen as a proxy for alcohol consumed at home. But there are a couple of other places where this alcohol could be consumed. Um, so it could be consumed at restaurants that allow you to bring your own alcohol. I mean, this is fine as long as the change in the prevalence of people doing this is uncorrelated with the implementation of smoking bans. Um, it could also be consumed, you know, at a house party or a dinner party, um, which doesn't matter in terms of identifying the effect on bar and restaurant consumption versus consumption at someone's home, but it could matter for externalities. Um, so, you know, if someone is drinking in their own home, they might not drive drunk afterwards. Um, but if someone is going to you know, a dinner party or a house party, they might um, drink too much and then drive drunk home. Um, and I couldn't distinguish between that scenario and someone um, drinking at a bar and driving drunk home in terms of the drunk driving outcomes. A couple other um, issues with any you know, self-reported data are social desirability bias and recall bias. Um, social, social desirability bias could occur because smoking and drinking are stigmatized in some social circles. And so people may underreport, um, you know, whether they smoke or how much alcohol they drink. Um, again, as long as the prevalence of people underreporting their alcohol consumption or their smoking status, as long as that's uncorrelated with the implementation of smoking bans, that's not a problem for my analysis. Um, and then recall bias. Um, probably won't be an issue with, you know, whether someone is a smoker or not, but people may not correctly remember their alcohol consumption over the past month. Um, so, you know, if you're asked on how many days in the last month did you drink alcohol, maybe it was six, maybe it was seven, you know, people might not be 100% sure, or they might not remember exactly how much alcohol they had to drink each day. Um, but again, as long as the prevalence of recall bias is uncorrelated with the implementation of smoking bans, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, so sometimes people are surprised by, I guess, depending on what you thought people drank, um, by either how much or how little people actually are drinking on average. Um, so I'd uh, like to show this table so that everyone can be on the same page. So on average, um, adults in the US drink around 12 servings of alcohol per month. Smokers, however, drink around twice as much as non-smokers. Um, so smokers drink around 17 drinks per month and non-smokers drink around nine drinks per month. Um, the second row is the extensive margin. So that's whether people report drinking at all in the past month. Um, here, around half of adults report drinking in the last month. Um, smokers are a little more likely to drink than non-smokers, um, but the prevalence is relatively similar. And then the, the last row is the intensive margin, which is the number of drinks 
per month for people who report drinking at all. Um, and so here, um, the average is around 24 drinks per month. Smokers drink around 30 drinks per month, which is a little bit more than one drink per day. And then non-smokers drink around 19 drinks per month. Um, I also, you know, use uh, two more data sources for the alcohol-related externalities. The Uniform Crime Reports uh, records crimes reported to law enforcement agencies. And the Fatality Analysis Reporting System is the universe of fatal motor vehicle incidents on public roadways in the US. And these also contain measures of alcohol involved crashes. And then I'm using a difference in differences method for my analysis, where my identification strategy um, uses the variation in the effective dates of smoking bans in bars and restaurants at the county level. Um, and the treatment variable, this is a little bit different than a standard difference in differences. Um, it's the fraction of the county population that is subject to a smoking ban in bars and restaurants. Um, so this incorporates the city level bans um, as opposed to a binary variable. Um, so I'll pause here uh, for any questions. Uh, thanks, Sam. So if anybody has questions, please um, enter those into the Q&A um, uh, feature. And in the meantime, I'll turn it over to our discussant today, Justin White. Yeah, th thanks. Um, and I, I had a couple questions. Um, one is, what is known about how well the smoking bans were enforced? And I, I read anecdotally that there was some non-compliance and maybe some venues offered more outdoor seating or something along those lines. Um, and I, I'm particularly wondering whether that non-compliance might be correlated with area level smoking rates. So I like my prior would be that areas that have high smoking rates might be more likely to have non-compliance and that, um, you know, maybe because there's stronger norms for smoking or more patrons who are uh, smoking. And it seems like that could be relevant for uh, especially the externalities piece um, where you do look at like uh, motor, later on motor, motor vehicle accidents by um, area level smoking status. Yeah, um, so I think initially there, might have been a little more non-compliance, but over time um, that kind of changed. So I think I recall reading something about like the number of complaints of violations in, it might have been, actually I forget where it was, so I don't want to guess. Um, but you know, there were initially like a handful of, of complaints for violations, um, but after a couple years that kind of died down. Um, you know, I think you're right that another way that bars and restaurants can kind of not necessarily get around these bands, but like manage the bands is to uh, have like outdoor uh, seating areas, which allows people to smoke while they're drinking, depending on um, like the exact wording of the smoking ban. And, you know, in some places, like you're not allowed to smoke within 25 feet of a doorway. Um, so to the extent that compliance isn't perfect, um, you can think of a smoking ban as kind of representing an instrument for an actual smoking ban and it's like an intent to treat. Um, in terms of, you know, the effects on the externalities, um, at the end, if I have time, um, I'll show the effects on alcohol consumption um, by like smoking prevalence. So like alcohol consumption in areas with a high prevalence of smoking versus medium and low prevalence of smoking. So that um, might address uh, that question a little bit. Thanks. Um, so I, I was, I, I think you, you have a nice use of multiple data sets here in, in this paper. And um, you, you also show in the paper, um, you know, how smoking consumption in your data matches other data sets, which I, I thought was really great for getting a sense of underreporting. I was curious whether it would, I think it would be great to show um, on screen, but I, I was also curious if you have also compared alcohol consumption in Burfus and Nielsen um, to other data sets or, or whether other people have done that to get a sense of like how uh, complete those data are, especially because to some extent you're inferring um, restaurant and bar consumption based on the comparison of the two data sets. So yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I haven't done that yet. I also haven't seen that done before, uh, but that is definitely something that, that I could do um, and I think would be interesting um, to compare, you know, especially to kind of check that, you know, the Burfus is in line with other 
um, data sets that use self-reported alcohol consumption, like um, the NHANES and the NHIS. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about, you know, a good way to compare Nielsen data. Um, like I know tobacco sales um, are in the TBOT, like the tax burden on tobacco. I'm not sure if there's a similar like publication for alcohol sales um, that you might be able to compare the Nielsen to. Um, you might be able to use consumer expenditure survey, perhaps. I, I don't know. Uh, if that yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Um, okay, uh, I'll hold other questions till um, later on. Thanks. Okay. Um, one question from uh, one of our panelists. Um, how did you code partial bans in bans with designated areas? Mm, um, yeah, so I just um, count a smoking ban um, as, you know, if there's a like ban effective in bars and restaurants. Um, and so, you know, you're right that I'm not kind of capturing that subtlety of Perhaps there were um, exemptions for like pre-existing bars and restaurants um, or some kind of like window in which uh, they can kind of become compliant. Um, and I also haven't, you know, coded up these um, rules for like outdoor seating and um, like patio type environments. Um, Something that I would like to do um, in one of my next steps though is uh, to try to incorporate some kind of controls or like interact the bands with um, like weather or temperature variables um, just because you might think that you know a place such as Dallas is somewhere where people could sit outside year round um, at a bar and drink while they're smoking but a place like Ithaca um, people generally don't want to spend too much time outside in like January or, you know, in, in the winter more generally. Um, and so you might expect kind of different effects, even like within those, you know, patio laws um, based on where, uh, where the bans are happening. Um, and I'm assuming that you, uh, Stop your analysis in 2012 because that is when the county FIPS codes uh, end uh, in the publicly available uh, uh, BRFIS data. Um, uh, you can get access to uh, county FIPS codes through the RDC network. Um, I know Catherine McLean and I have, have used that in some of our work. Have you considered potentially in the future extending it into more recent years, your analysis? Oh, yeah, thanks. I um. Yeah, I didn't know that. So that's, that's good to know. And I'll definitely look into, um, into getting the data. I um, think, you know, one thing to be a little bit wary about with adding years after 2012 um, is that 2012 is also when states started um, passing recreational marijuana laws. And then um, I'm not sure exactly like when e-cigarettes started becoming like a lot more popular, um, but I think it was like around or a little bit after um, 2012 and so kind of the like those substitutable um, like risky health behaviors might kind of confound the analysis a little bit um, but that mm -hmm. is definitely something that I'll look into. Right um, uh, here's a, a comment I guess uh, curious to hear your reactions to it Nielsen's consumer panel is known for under-reporting alcohol and tobacco purchases, especially if underage users have purchased these products, they are not going to inform the head of household who is in charge of entering these purchases. This is just a big caveat to keep in mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's good to know. Um, I think in terms of, you know, underage users, I think it's okay that I'm not like observing their alcohol consumption because I'm also not observing it in the burfus. Um, and so, you know, if underage users are kind of contributing to the household alcohol purchases, like that's not something that I want to include if I'm just trying to find the effects on um, adults' alcohol consumption. Um, but that, that is, uh, yeah, something to definitely think about. Okay. And then um, finally, before we, we move on, um, uh, why not use Nielsen retail sales? Why the Nielsen uh, uh, home scan data? Yeah, so um, I think my rationale for using the home scan data is that I know where the consumers live. Um, whereas with the retail data, that's not perfectly matched to where people live. So, 
you know, people could be grocery shopping, like in other cities, especially if they live in a more rural area, um, especially with things like alcohol and cigarettes, which have pretty different uh, tax rates. Um, and alcohol also has like a lot of different regulations on uh, like location of sale across states. So in some places, you know, you can buy beer, wine, and liquor in a grocery store, but in other places, you can only buy liquor in like a state run store and there are a lot fewer of those. Um, and so I'm not sure how well the retail scanner data would match up with like where people actually live and where they're actually consuming the alcohol. Okay. And uh, two questions about the 2011 Burfus kind of redesign uh, with the with the survey uh, weights changing in 2011, the cell phone uh, sample being added. Um, how did how did you think about that in your analysis? Yeah, so I think um, part of that will be captured by the year fixed effects um, because you know you have like the 2011 and 2012 fixed effects. And so if there are any like level changes in, um, in the Burfus, um, that should be captured by those. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. And I'll let you continue with your presentation. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, okay, so here is the uh, regression equation that I'm using for the alcohol consumption outcomes um, for, you know, smoking, all you have to do is just switch the variable on the on the left hand side. Um, so on the you know the outcome is the alcohol related outcome in county C at time t. Um, oh, I don't think I mentioned it yet. Uh, might be good to mention uh, because the Burfus is at the individual level, whereas the Nielsen Consumer Panel is at the household level. Um, to address that observational unit mismatch, I aggregate each of those data sets up to the county month level on a per capita basis just to more um, directly be able to compare results from regressions using each of those data sets. Um, so the main you know, variable of interest is a, the fraction of the county population that's subject to a smoking ban in bars and restaurants. Um, the reason I've coded it up this way to be bars and restaurants is that with the exception of a handful of cities, any jurisdiction that implements a smoking ban in a bar either already has a smoking ban in restaurants or they can currently implement one. So there aren't really any places that have a smoking ban in a bar but not in a restaurant. So to identify the effect on bars, you know, really kind of have to measure like smoking bans in bars and restaurants. And then I separately control for places that have smoking bans in restaurants only. I also control for county level demographic characteristics, um, and then the state level blood alcohol concentration limit, and the state cigarette tax. I include county and time fixed effects. I cluster the standard errors at the county level, and then I weight the regressions by the county population so that you can think of the effect as being the effect on the average person as opposed to the effect on the average county. Here are my kind of headline results um, using the Burfus data. So this graph is showing the effect of smoking bans on a variety of measures of alcohol consumption. So on the left is the effect on overall alcohol consumption. And I find that smoking bans in bars and restaurants lead to an increase of about one half of a drink per month, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, but it's around a four and a half percent increase. The second column shows the effect on the extensive margin Again, that's whether people report drinking any alcohol in the past month. Um, here you can see that this effect is um, almost zero. So it's like a fraction of a percentage point. Um, and it's you know, not statistically significant. Um, I can rule out changes of more than like half of a percentage point um, in either direction. Um, so I interpret that as you know, smoking bans don't have an effect on whether people drink alcohol at all. The third column shows the intensive margin effect. Again, that is the amount of alcohol that people consume, a conditional on drinking at all in the past month. Here I find that smoking bans lead to an increase of almost one drink per month, which is a 4% increase. And then you can disaggregate the intensive margin effect into the effect on the number of days that someone drinks alcohol in the past month, and then the average amount of alcohol that they consume each day that they drink. 
Um, for both of these, I find uh, small increases, um, but the effect on the number of days is not statistically significant. And then lastly, I analyzed the effect on the maximum amount of alcohol consumed on one occasion as a way to try to identify whether smoking bans are leading to uh, potentially unhealthy changes in alcohol consumption, such as binge drinking. Um, here, I also find a small increase, um, but it's around a 2% increase, um, which is pretty small um, and you know, not too concerning uh, from a health perspective. This graph is showing the effect of smoking bans on alcohol purchases in the Nielsen data. Um, again, this is proxying for at-home alcohol consumption. So the first column is showing the effect on the total quantity of alcohol purchased. Here I find a small decline. Um, and then the second column is showing the effect on the extensive margin, so whether people are purchasing alcohol in the past month. Um, here there's also a small decline, although it's not statistically significant. Um, but I can kind of rule out uh, meaningful increases in the prevalence of people purchasing alcohol in the last month to consume at home. So when you compare, you know, the Nielsen results with the Burfus results, in the Burfus I find um, small increases in alcohol consumption, um, but from the Nielsen, these don't appear to be coming from um, consumption at home, which would suggest that the increases are coming from bar and restaurant alcohol consumption. Okay, and because, you know, this is a um, tobacco seminar, this perhaps for some of you will be the most interesting part of the talk um, because I now look at smoking. Um, so before I kind of disaggregate my results and show you the effect um, of smoking bans on alcohol consumption by smoking status, um, I first want to talk about the potential endogeneity of smoking status. Um, so previous research has found that anti-smoking policies lead some people to quit smoking and prevent others from initiating smoking. And so this could lead to changes in the composition of smoking status groups. Um, if this is occurring randomly with respect to alcohol consumption, then that isn't so much of a problem. Um, but you, know, you might expect a scenario where the heaviest drinkers who smoke are the ones who decide to quit smoking after a smoking ban is implemented. And so it would look like the average alcohol consumption of smokers went down when really it was just the heaviest drinkers are no longer counted in the smoking group. Um, however, I don't find that to be the case. So this graph is showing the effect of smoking bans on um, the prevalence of each smoking status um, in the Burfus. So frequent smoker, those are people who report smoking cigarettes every day occasional smoker, people who smoke some days, um, people who've never smoked cigarettes, and then former smokers. Um, so here, you know, again, I find um, very small effects. Um, they're generally not statistically significant. So this effect for occasional smokers is marginally significant, um, like at the 10% level, um, but it's also quite small. It's around 0.2 percentage points. Um, and so in general, you know, I can rule out um, meaningful changes in the prevalence of smoking status. Um, again, this is during my sample period, just 2004 to 2012. Um, these results, you know, don't necessarily contradict the literature finding smoking bans reduce smoking. A lot of that literature um, looked at earlier time periods um, by, you know, the early to mid 2000s. Smoking prevalence in the US has already decreased pretty dramatically from like 30 to 40 years prior. Um, and so you might expect that, you know, more recently smoking bans wouldn't have as much of an effect on smoking because the people who still smoke have the most inelastic demand for smoking. Um, so now I'll show you the results um, broken out by smoking status. Um, so for the Burfus, I'll just focus on the extensive and the intensive margins. This graph is showing the effect on the extensive margin, so whether people report drinking at all. Um, here I find very similar results to the overall uh, results in that, you know, there's essentially no change on whether people report drinking at all for any smoking status. For the intensive margin, 
Um, that's the amount of alcohol people report drinking in the last month, conditional on drinking. I find across the board increases um, in alcohol consumption, um, but the effects are only statistically significant for occasional and former smokers. Occasional smokers drink an additional 2.2 drinks per month. Former smokers drink an additional 1.4 drinks per month. That's an 8% and a 6% increase, uh, respectively. So I'll show you in the next couple of slides that these increases don't appear to be coming from the Nielsen data. So what I think is going on here um, for former smokers is that prior to a smoking ban, they didn't want to go out to a bar or they didn't want to stay very long at the bar because they didn't want to be around other people smoking for fear that that might trigger them to relapse and start smoking again. After a smoking ban is implemented, they feel more comfortable going out to bars. And so, um, or they feel comfortable staying a little bit longer. And so they're drinking a little bit more. Um, occasional smokers, I don't want to read too much into this group because it's such a small part of the sample. Um, so those percentages at the bottom um, reflect the prevalence of each group. So only about 5% of adults in the US are occasional smokers. Um, but what could be going on here is that, you know, now they have uh, more friends going out with them, like their former smoker friends, and so they're also um, drinking more. And so here are the results um, in the Nielsen data, uh, split into smokers and non-smokers. Um, so for the total quantity of alcohol purchased for home consumption, I again find small declines for both smokers and non-smokers. Um, although these are not necessarily statistically significant, um, but the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval is like a very small positive number, um, which suggests that, you know, these uh, smoking bans are not having the effect of increasing uh, alcohol purchases. And then for the uh, prevalence of purchasing alcohol, um, I again find small declines, although these effects are not statistically significant, um, but I can rule out, you know, changes of more than uh, like one percentage point. Um, so again, just to recap, um, and then I'll, I'll pause for um, more questions. Um, it appears that smoking bans lead to small increases in alcohol consumption. So on average, around one drink per month for people who drink. Um, there's no effect on the prevalence of smoking. And then when you disaggregate uh, the effect of smoking bans on alcohol consumption by smoking status, it appears that these increases are concentrated among occasional and former smokers. Um, and it also seems that uh, the most likely source for this increased alcohol consumption is bars and restaurants as opposed to at home. Mike, you're muted. Thanks. I'll turn it over to Justin for any discussion comments. Yeah, I think there, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, I, I really like how you, you mentioned early on that you're able to look at a number of different um, margins for behavioral responses. Um, and that, I, I think that's great. Um, I, I do wonder, though, if you also looked at a, a specific measure of likelihood of binge drinking. I, I know that Burfus does have um, something like five plus drinks per day. And I, it seems like from a public health perspective, that would be something that would be noteworthy if, if that changed, as well as it seems like for the problem behaviors like uh, accidents or like the externalities on accidents or crime, it seems like binge drinking would certainly go along with those. And so I am curious if, if you looked at that specific measure as well, since it does seem slightly different from the max measure that you are currently including. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't looked at binge drinking yet because in the middle of my sample period, Burfus changed the definition of binge drinking for women. So initially, um, binge drinking was defined as five or more drinks on one occasion for men and women. And then um, a few years into my sample period, um, for women, they switched it to four or more drinks on one occasion. Um, I think I could probably code up a consistent binge drinking measure by hand, if it's just like a, did you binge drink in the past month? I should be able to identify that from the maximum um, question. So just like, you know, recoding, probably move the four plus drinks for women back to the beginning of the sample period. Um, 
but yeah, that's why I haven't done it yet, but it is definitely something that I think you're right. I think is an interesting outcome to look at. Cool. Um, I, I was also wondering sort of what you make of the fact that there you're, you're finding in the Nielsen data decreases in um, alcohol consumption at home, in, including among smokers. And, and so uh, I, I guess I, given that we're not finding a decrease overall, um, sort of like what, what you make of the fact that there's less consumption at, um, at home. Yeah, so I think what's going on there um, is that I do find increases in alcohol consumption for frequent smokers. Um, it's just not statistically significant. Um, and so it could be a story of everybody enjoys the bar more after smoking bans are implemented, um, which, you know, might have been a surprise to both bar owners and, and to them. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that, like, nobody probably enjoys cigarette smoke. Uh, like, if you're a smoker, you might enjoy being the only one smoking in the bar, but you'd maybe rather not, like, have to be around everyone else's um, cigarette smoke. Um, but I think, you know, the environment of bars is changing quite a bit. And, you know, you're perhaps seeing like more people going out to bars um, now after smoking bans are implemented. Um, and so, you know, even smokers might still be going out uh, to bars after smoking bans are implemented, even if they can't drink more. Um, and this also may kind of reflect your um, earlier point about kind of the heterogeneity and the laws and the ways in which people can kind of get around them. Um, like if people are just going out onto the patio to smoke while they drink, then presumably that might not like affect smokers as much as if they can't um, smoke anywhere in the vicinity of the bar. Yeah, um, so I, I see there's a number of other questions. So maybe I'll ask just one more quick one. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting the um, the heterogeneity that occasional and former smokers are, um, you know, the, the effects are, are concentrated among those groups, the um, increases in uh, alcohol consumption. Is that is that a case where you could analyze the data also at the individual level to sort of do a formal interaction test? It, it, it just looks to me like sort of that maybe it's not significantly different in those groups from the other ones. And I'm wondering if there's sort of like a, if you could formally test that in some way. Yeah, um, I could, you know, definitely test it um, at the individual level, you know, have all the individual level purpose um, data. Um, and especially if I wasn't trying to compare it to like the Nielsen outcomes and just kind of looking at it in its own right. Um, I think that might be a case where it would make sense to look at the individual level data. Okay, um, uh, question from the audience. Uh, have you considered uh, your findings, uh, have you compared your findings with bar revenue data? I have not, um, but there are some other papers that have looked at um, what happens to bar revenues after smoking bans. Um, I think they might have been like for specific states. Um, and if I'm remembering them correctly, um, the result of those papers are that, you know, either there's no change in bar revenues or there's an increase in bar revenues after these smoking bans are implemented. And what was the effect on the frequency of drinking at home instead of going to the bar? Yeah, so that's a great question and I wish I could answer it. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have like any data to address that question. Um, you know, the, like the Nielsen people scan in their purchases when they buy them, um, but that's not necessarily, uh, when they're drinking the alcohol. Um, I mean, I, I could try to look at, you know, the, the prevalence of alcohol purchases and how many times they're purchasing alcohol in um, a given month, which might shed some light on that question. Um, okay. Um, one methodological suggestion, uh, have you considered clustering your standard errors at the state level since that's probably where most of your variation is coming from? Yeah, um, that's a good point. I haven't done that yet. Um, that is definitely uh, on my to-do list though. Okay. Um, and have you considered, uh, have you thought about using the 
um, National Epidemiological Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions uh, data, um, which this has information on where you drink at home, at bars, et cetera. Oh, that's great. Um, I actually wasn't aware of that survey, um, but I'll definitely have to um, look into it. Yeah, it's a, a NIAAA data set restricted access, apparently. Um, okay. Yeah, and I um, think that gets me through the, uh, the comments. I guess just from myself, um, one uh, suggestion was uh, considering with the Burfus data, especially aggregating the occasional smoker and the frequent smoker uh, uh, together as another column of um, results, because I'm kind of with the occasional smokers, I'm a little bit worried about like people, frequent smokers becoming occasional smokers, and then some occasional smokers maybe becoming former smokers. So it's a little bit hard for me to understand uh, that category. And it might be nice to show smoking, both any smoking and then separate like you, like you do currently. Yeah, um, that's a good idea. And I can definitely uh, do that. Okay. And, and for the binge drinking uh, point that Justin made earlier, uh, one idea as well would be just focusing on the males who don't have a change in the binge drinking definition throughout your sample um, to uh, you could provide the binge drinking that I think consistently for, for that population. Yeah, that's, um, that's also a good idea, especially because I think men um, generally tend to be the, the one who are more likely to be involved in um, like drunk driver related crashes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll let you continue with your presentation. Okay, great. Um, so I think I should be able to get through uh, the rest of this in about five minutes, and that should leave some more time for questions at the end. Um, so this uh, table is showing the effect of smoking bans on uh, violent crimes um, using the UCR data. Um, and you know, here I find uh, that the effect on overall violent crime, as well as murder, uh, rape, aggravated assault, and simple assault. Um, the effects are all uh, quite small, so ranging from like minus 2% to plus 2%, um, and they're not statistically significant. And then before I show you the results for drunk driving, um, I just wanted to highlight, because it's a little bit different of an equation, um, what exactly I'm doing here. Um, so on the left-hand side is the uh, log of the count of fatal drunk driving crashes um, plus one, um, which is just a monotonic transformation of the data because a lot of counties um, don't have any fatal crashes in a given month, um, which is you know a good thing. Um, fatal crashes are not something that we want to happen. Um, I haven't yet done robustness checks of like a Poisson or a negative binomial uh, model to kind of better deal with the count data, um, but that is something that's on my to-do list. Um, and then the other difference um, with this equation is that I interact the treatment variable with indicators for high, medium, and low smoking prevalence. Um, and so to do this, um, I'm actually using uh, a different data source, the tobacco use supplement to the current population survey. Um, and I'm using state level measures of smoking prevalence. Um, I wanted a measure of smoking prevalence that uh, was taken prior to the implementation of smoking bans, just in case there was an effect of smoking bans on smoking. Um, and you know, the, I think the TUS is kind of the, one of the only data sets that, that measures um, smoking prevalence um, like that far back. So I'm using the 1992 wave of the, the TUS um, and I split states into high, medium, and low. Um, low smoking corresponds to, I think, uh, 10 to 15% of adults smoke and then medium smoking is around 15 to 20 um, and high is around 20 to 25%. So when I um, just run a regression on drunk driving crashes um, without interacting by smoking. So that's that first column. Um, I find no effect of smoking bans on drunk driving crashes. But when I interact uh, the treatment variable with those smoking prevalence measures, um, I find a 4% increase in fatal drunk driving crashes um, in areas with a high prevalence of smoking. Um, this effect is somewhat offset by small declines in medium and low smoking prevalence areas, although those effects are not statistically significant. 
then I conduct a variety of alternative specifications and robustness checks. So um, for the results um, that are drinking by smoking status, um, I also analyze the effect on the number of days spent drinking, the average amount consumed per day, and the maximum amount consumed on one occasion. Um, I also run a robustness check where I only analyze the effect of state level bans. So any place that only has county or city level bans um, is considered to be part of the control group. Um, this is to compare my results um, with some of that prior literature on smoking bans and alcohol consumption. Um, I also run another robustness check where I exclude the city level bans. Um, and then uh, similar to what I've done with the drunk driving crashes, um, I interact the treatment variable with those indicators for smoking prevalence um, and analyze the effects um, on drinking and uh, smoking status. Um, broadly speaking, the results um, with all these robustness checks are similar to what I've already shown you. Um, but, you know, when I take questions at the end, I'm happy to go back and um, show you these in more detail. Um, so just to conclude, I mean, think back to the beginning and kind of what people predicted would happen with smoking bans. Um, so first, you know, the big concern of bar and restaurant owners, uh, would people drink less in their establishments? I mean, I find that that's not the case. So on average, um, alcohol consumption increases by one drink per month, um, which is 2.2 uh, drinks per month for occasional smokers and 1.4 drinks per month for former smokers. Um, and these effects are most likely coming um, from bar and restaurant consumption as opposed to at home. Um, I don't find you know, statistically significant effects on violent crimes, but I do find small increases in fatal drunk driving crashes in areas with a high prevalence of smoking. Um, and so this just suggests that the optimal policy needs to anticipate the substitutability or complementarity of risky health behaviors because a policy that was ostensibly targeted towards smoking ended up having these unintended consequences um, on alcohol consumption and drunk driving. And so in terms of some next steps, in addition to what I've already mentioned, um, I don't think I showed you any event studies, so <laughs> just ignore the additional, uh, but I plan to um, conduct uh, some event studies, um, especially where I incorporate um, some of the recent methodological advances um, in the like diff and diff and two-way fixed effects literature uh, to deal with the staggered um, timing. I also plan to test for heterogeneity in the policy impacts. Um, so trying to directly test for the avoidance of smoking bans by driving to nearby cities and counties. Um, which I can do by incorporating a measure of driving distance to the nearest county with like a different smoking ban policy. And then also analyzing um, possible differential effects by geographic region because there are um, like quite different prevalences of smoking um, in different regions of the US. And so people might be responding to this policy in different ways. Um, and then I also intend to do a back of the envelope uh, cost benefit analysis comparing the health benefits of secondhand smoke avoided, uh, pulling estimates from other papers um, to the lives lost from drunk driving. Um, okay, so that's all I have for today, um, but happy to, to take your questions now. Thank you. Justin, did you have any uh, further discussion comments? Uh, sure, maybe, I, uh, um, so, I, I guess uh, it's really interesting. I was somewhat surprised that, that um, the alcohol consumption did flow through to the um, increased motor vehicle fatalities. And it, it does look like, it, like overall there's no change, but it's really among the, the high smoking rate um, areas. And perhaps this is, is unfair because you didn't show it, but it is in your extra slides that it looks like the alcohol change in the high smoking areas is actually much smaller and null relative to it's actually the low smoking areas. And so I, I guess for me that sort of raised a bit of concern about like are, are we detecting um, really changes as a result of the, the bans or not. And I'd be curious to hear what your further thoughts on that would be, especially because I think this is a point that a lot of people, it's like one of the key points that I think people are going to take from your paper. Um, just to see if there's anything more like that you can do to like make that finding more 
solid. Um, I, I, saw, I see that Ken Warner in the comments, for example, suggests including other county level measures. I don't know if there are other um, uh, alcohol policies that you could control for in addition to what you're already doing as well. Or, um, you know, I, I don't think I appreciated that you would just have a point in time uh, smoking measure, not over time. So I was thinking originally that you could look at pre-trends between smoking and uh, high, high prevalence and low prevalent smoking prevalence areas that you could potentially look at that to make sure that this is a valid comparison. Um, but, but I'm just thinking that there might be a little bit more that you could dig into on, on that finding. Yeah, so that's why I think it's really important um, to try to test for this avoidance of the bans um, because changes in drunk driving could be coming from changes in the amount of alcohol people are consuming or it could also be coming from changes in where people are consuming alcohol. So if people are, instead of going to their local bar that they can like walk to from their house, um, or maybe that's just like a, a five minute drive um, versus, you know, driving like 15, 20, 30 minutes to another city to go to a bar that doesn't have a smoking ban so that they can smoke while drinking at the bar, um, you know, they might be more likely to uh, get into a crash, um, like the longer that they're driving. So even if they're not increasing their alcohol consumption, you know, if they're like drunk in both scenarios, but in only one they're, they're driving or if they're driving a much longer distance, then that could be um, affecting their alcohol consumption or not their alcohol consumption. That could be affecting um, drunk driving uh, crashes. Uh, but I think you do make a good point that there are potentially other like local policies, especially alcohol related policies um, that I could try to um, incorporate. Yeah, so one other, so th this goes with what Catherine says in, in just in the chat that um, why not look at nuisance crimes, public drunkenness or DUIs. It seems like you could maybe look at not just fatal crashes, but other crashes as well. And potentially that would uh, increase sample size such that you could also maybe use like time of day or day of week, um, which is in your data to see like, like when bars close, for example, or like when uh, evening might, might be another way to, to sort of um, hone in on, on that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Um, so I think Justin, he covered some of the, uh, some of the, the comments. Um, so I guess just to return to Ken Werner's uh, question, he was wondering specifically about cigarette taxes and if you included county or city specific taxes in your um, regression model. Yeah, so I control for state level cigarette taxes, um, but not yet the county or the city level. Um, yeah, that could be a, a good idea, especially because local jurisdictions that implement smoking bans might also be more likely to have um, much higher mm -hmm. cigarette taxes than like the surrounding state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation, they uh, maintain a local uh, cigarette tax database that um, is very comprehensive. So that would be your best source of information on all of the local um, local taxes. Um, and just a methodological uh, uh, comment from, um, uh, from Catherine uh, suggesting um, for your event studies, um, uh, considering including future policy changers uh, in your event study, because we you only have data through 2012, but we know that you know the states uh, are continue states and counties are continuing to pass these laws after 2012, and so you might want to include that in uh, one of your event study specifications. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks. Sure. Unless there's any other questions or comments, um, I'm not seeing any further. So I'm going to send it over to C then. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you, Anne, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussions. Uh, finally, thank you for the audience of over 90 people for your participation. Our next seminar speaker will be John Buckle, giving a presentation on April 15th, titled Harm Reduction for Smokers Who Do Not Want to Quit using tobacco policy to encourage switching to e-cigarettes. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey. Are you satisfaction uh, with the seminar today? We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top snow weekend. Thank you. <laughs>